slapping another uh, framework in your faces. There's a lot to digest today already. And I'm also going to try to uh, kind of go a little fast. Ah, that, this is a little more animated than the last one. All right, hopefully we can live with the, the little waterfall. Anyway, so uh, my talk is about a framework for actual gamification. And uh, so today I'm Yukai Chow. I'm going to be your guild leader. So I'm going to take you to a quick, short journey of gamification. And so Mario already went through a little bit of my background. I actually started working in gamification uh, for about 10 years in 2003. Started off as a, uh, a lonely hobby and passion and then eventually kind of grew. I uh, talked about gamification at Stanford occasionally. I created Octalysis and as Mario said, this, the UK-based company rated me the number one gamification guru um, on a leaderboard game. So when it comes to games, right, one of the things I love to talk about is the magic, right? Because a lot of people say kids these days don't have any discipline. They, you know, they're, they can't work hard, they have no good work ethics, right? But when it comes to games, kids have amazing work ethics. I don't know why I keep flashing, but they have amazing work ethics. A lot of kids actually wake up 3 a.m. in the morning, behind their parents' back, to go on a computer and start playing games, leveling up their character. And if you've played games like role-playing games, RPGs, you'll know that leveling up often involves killing the exact same monsters over and over and over again on the same stage for hours, for and hours and hours, for weeks. In the gaming world, this is called grinding. It's, called, it's kind of fun and addicting. People say, I need to go home and grind for another two hours. You know? Now, in the real world, we call that grunt work. right? You do the exact same things over and over and over for hours straight. And usually it's boring and torturous. No one likes to do grunt work. So if games can get kids, again, who have no discipline, no work ethics, to wake up 3 a.m. in the morning behind their parents' back, risk being grounded to secretly do grunt work. And you understand why that is. I believe we can get people to do anything, if it's well designed. So, gamification is actually a term I'm not a big fan of. I think the real term is human-focused design, and earlier we talked about human-centered design, but it's really, again, it's human-focused design as a contrast to function-focused design. So most design process is focused on, on the function. It's focused on output and efficiency. And it's kind of like a factory. You, you, you assume that people in the factory will do their work and you optimize it for output and for efficiency. And um, human focused design is a system that remembers people within the system have feelings, have motivations, have, have uh, insecurities, have reason why they want to do something or why they don't want to do something. So it's kind of like a theme park where you optimize it to be really, really fun and then you can predict that people will automatically line up for hours and hours just to enjoy the experience. And the reason why we call gamification is the gaming industry has been the first one to master what I call human-focused design, because games have no other purpose than to entertain people, right? They have maybe some purpose like killing a drag and saving the world, uh, but those are just made up excuses to entertain the human. And so because games have spent decades, in new centuries, depending on what you qual qualify as a game, uh, entertaining and mastering human-focused design, we're, now we're learning from games, and that's why we call it human-focused design. So to bring it a little bit more into context, here's a few examples. So um, this is one of my favorites called Folded. So scientists have been figuring out how to uh, understand a, a virus, a, a AIDS virus structure. And so and the top PhD scientists in the world couldn't figure this out for 15 years. So they decided to say, hey, let's, let's make a game and put it on the internet. It's called Folded. It's just a game where you fold proteins around, you try to optimize for a few things, and let's see if someone solves the problem that we couldn't solve. And what you know, a 15-year AIDS problem was solved in 10 days. Some gamer, not in science, is just like, hey, this is kind of fun, and he solved the problem. Right? <laughs> also, in other applications, O Power is a utility company, and they're trying to get people to save more energy on their utility bills. And so they use a simple structure that they've learned from games. You know, they have some comparison chart, they have how you grow, how you where you are, how you compare to your peers, your neighbor, you know, and whatnot. And it just shows people comparative data about, hey, Am I in a competition? Am I cooperating with people? How do I do this well? And so within a year, they saved one terawatt, which is $120 million of uh, energy savings, which is quite a bit in terms of energy bills. Um, it can also be used in other things like sales, right? Autodesk, we're pretty familiar. They're trying to sell their, their hefty design software, uh, 3D design software. And these are pretty expensive, $7,000 a piece. So they're trying to increase their sales for that. So they created a game where in order to play the game, the first thing you need to do is to download their free trial. And then it brings you on an adventure. You're traveling all over the, all over the world, obviously, on, on your screen, a fantasy world, where you have to solve problems, like, you know, a crack building, you know, floods coming, and you have to use the free trial, Autocast, to, to, to fix the problem. And so what we have here is that it increased trial usage by 40%, but more importantly, 
and increase convergence by 15%. So we see gamification pushing all kinds of examples, all fields, you know, pushing important numbers by double or even sometimes triple digits for it. Now, um, now gamification, a lot of people say, hey, is that, is that a fad right now? What's going on? It, it is a global movement at this point. Gartner predicts that 70% of Fortune 500s will use gamification by 2014. Now, the problem is that it, they also predicted that 80% of those gamified apps will fail due to bad design. And so there's a few reasons why that happens. The first one is, you know, people like big concepts, but the execution is a hard thing, right? Like this comic that says, sales are dropping like a rock. Our plan is to create something awesome that everyone wants to buy. All right, my visionary work is done. How long your, your work, will your work take, right? It's people know they want to do something awesome, something fun, exciting, but they don't know how to do it. And adding some, fi uh, some, some fire to that is that, hey, there's a lot of agency images. When something becomes a buzzword, they're all like, hey, you know, we, we're going to add this to our latest expertise, whether it's social media, it's cloud, it's whatever, right? And so, and so another thing is everyone, when they, talk, when they talk about gamification, they, they focus on what we call the PBLs, the points, badges, and leaderboards. You hire someone, it's like, okay, let me see where you can put points, or let's see where the badges go. And this, if I remember correctly, is very similar to about three, four years ago in social media marketing, where there's a bunch of social media experts who can tell you how the, how the world is going to change because of it, you know, how, this, how everyone's a publisher now. But when you actually hire them, all they know how to do is create a Facebook a fan page and a Twitter profile. It's like, look, we're doing social media marketing. Right? It's the same thing. <coughs> and real, as we now know, like, obviously, social media marketing is not really just creating a Twitter profile and a Facebook page. It's more about engagement uh, and creating value. And the final cause, I think, is really a lot of people are really obsessed with the fancy stuff, the game mechanics, and you know, where, where do all the narrative and all that stuff. But they really miss out on the core drives. So if we take an example of a bad game designer. A bad game designer can think, all right, in my game we need swords. Where can they go? You know, yeah, monsters. You know, oh yeah, of course we need cows, we need friends who can fertilize crops, we need angry birds, right? And so you could have all these game elements that are co correct and put it in a game and still be really boring and stupid. And if you think about it, every single game out there has game elements and game mechanics in them. But most of them are boring, most of them are losers, they don't, they're not very successful, and only a few very well designed games achieve the status of what I call winning and addicting. So when you look at a good game designer, you know, they think about it differently. They think about how do I want my users to feel, right? Do I want them to feel inspired? Do I want them to feel proud or even scared for horror games? And then once you understand how you want them to feel, that's when you figure out what the game elements you want to use. You know, maybe it's swords, maybe it's monsters, maybe it's cows, maybe it's angry birds, we don't know. So the key here is that game elements are a means to an end, not an end itself. It's you're trying to solve a problem with these elements, not have elements in it. So again, Good gamification starts off with our core drive. So this is where I created my framework called Octalysis, and it's been picked up pretty well. It's been translated to over 78 different languages, and uh, besides the flashing part again. Um, and so I basically broke down motivation into eight core drives. So focus on the eight in the middle. So the eight core drives are, the first one is epic, meaning, and calling. So that's basically you're doing something because it's something bigger than yourself. Right? This is why people contribute to Wikipedia. It's not because they want to make more money, it's not even because they want to build their resumes, but it's because they feel like they're protecting humanity's knowledge. You know, it's, some, it's a higher meaning, higher uh, purpose for them. The next is development and accomplishment, which is this, you know, just you're feeling that you're growing, you're leveling up, you're gaining experience, you're improving, you're achieving mastery. And, and this is where a lot of the, the points, badges, the leaderboards are at, are at. Then there's empowerment of creativity and feedback, which is like Lego. You give people the basic building blocks. And there's an infinite amount of ways to use your creativity, put it together, see what works, what doesn't work, what you like, what you don't like, and that's a very engaging process. And then number four is ownership and possession, which is the concept that because you feel like you own something, you want to you want to uh, protect it, you want to improve it, you also want to get more of it. And this is like a lot of virtual goods or even just collections, right? Collecting stamps, that's kind of fun. Completing a collection. Then the fifth one, or the sixth, uh, fifth one is social influence and relatedness. And this deals with all the type of social forces we see, you know, mentorship, envy, right? It's your friend telling you to do something. And this is pretty well studied these days if everyone wants to optimize about social. Um, and then there's scarcity and impatience, which is the concept that if you don't know what's going to happen next, um, or sorry, scarcity is you want something just because you can't have it. Um, so if grapes are on the table, you don't care about those grapes. But if grapes are just, just beyond your reach, you're always thinking about, oh, are those grapes sweet? You know, are they nice? Can I have them? When can I have them? And so this is something, for instance, um, that a lot of mobile games like to uh, optimize on. So some people start playing a game and say, I will never pay a single dollar for a game. 
And then it'll start dangling like a mansion for your face. Let's think uh, Farmville. Then people are like, oh, I kind of like this mansion. Let's see what I need to do to get it. Oh, I need to spend 20 hours of farming to get this mansion? That's a lot of time, right? It's like, oh, wait a second. I can just spend $5 and get the mansion immediately. $5 to save 20 hours of my time. That's a no-brainer, right? <laughs> so now you're no longer spending $5 to buy some pixels on your screen that does nothing. You're spending $5 to save your time. And that's the power of scarcity, where you, you, you see something you want, but you can't have it. You're willing to do, take all the different paths to get there. Unpredictability and curiosity is a concept that, because you don't know what's going to happen next, you're always thinking about it. And uh, you know, this is obviously very heavily used in gambling. There's a lot of science research behind that, the most famous being the Skinner box, which is an experiment where scientists put an animal in a box, there's a little lever. The first experiment is that when the animal presses the lever, food comes out. And so what you'll see there is the animal will press the lever to the point that it's no longer hungry because it doesn't need food anymore. But when you switch the experiment to the point where whenever you press the lever, food may or may not come out, and sometimes two come out, what you'll see is the animal constantly pressing the lever, regardless of if it's hungry or not, because it's just messing with its head, like, oh, will it come out, will it come out, will it come out, right? So again, that's heavily used in the gambling industry. And the last one is loss and avoidance, which is very straightforward. You're doing something because you want to avoid a loss. So those are the eight core drives, and I've seen almost everything you do, you're, you're driven by one of these eight core drives, and they're arranged on an octagon shape for a reason. So the ones on the left, I call them, are the left brain core drives, so they de deal with logic, calculations, ownership, and the ones on the right are the right brain core drives, where we deal with social, creativity, and the like. You might have noticed the ones on top are more inspired, are more positive. You know, I call them white hat gamification techniques. So if you're always doing something because you're part of a bigger picture, a bigger vision, and you're feeling you're growing, you're improving, and you're also using your creativity, <coughs> that's a very inspiring feel, and you feel good about it. The ones on the bottom, I call them black hat gamification techniques, and they're very powerful and very motivating. To, to drive action. But if you're always doing something because you want to avoid a loss, because you don't know what's going to happen next, or you can't have something, you know, again, it drives your actions tremendously, but whenever you can leave the system, you want to leave the system because you feel like you're not in control of yourself. Now, just because it's called black hat gamification doesn't necessarily mean it's bad because a lot of people voluntarily put themselves in black hat gamification in order to go to the gym more often, to eat healthily, to eat more carrots. And uh, for instance, here's an interesting example. This is a alarm clock where whenever you press the snooze button or you just don't turn it off quick enough, it destroys your money, right? So you have to wake, so you're waking up because of loss and avoidance. Again, the eighth core drive, right? Loss and avoidance. You're waking up because you don't want to lose money, right? And, and this actually evolved uh, into something better. It became a mobile app, so whenever you don't want to wake up, you snooze, you pay the developer a dollar, right? So then there's a revenue model and you're not breaking the law anymore. And so once we have that framework of eight core drives, then you can start analyzing all kinds of products that are wise and engaging. You look at Facebook, you know, you can look at Farmville, it appeals to people in a different way. You can obviously analyze games, you can look at Twitter, you know, whatnot. And so after you go through all of that and you understand how people are feeling, then that's when you understand, okay, what are the game mechanics and game elements should I use? Maybe I should add more elitism into the system. Maybe I should add more social quests, group quests or protection themes into the Maybe I should add Easter eggs. The, the key here is that it's never a cookie cutter solution. Gamification is about good design, just like any game. Like if someone comes to me and said, hey, Yukai, you know, I have, I'm creating a game where there's a ninja around jumping around killing monsters. Is that fun? I'm like, I don't know, right? It depends on how you design it, because you're just telling me the shell. And these are the shell things, right? You, you want to make sure the mechanics are there, the things that actually grab people's attention are there. And so that's, that's where you apply those, frame, those, those uh, game elements. And um, so that's level one octalysis. There's actually five levels. So if you want, you can push it up to level two, which is factoring the, uh, the four uh, experience phases of a game. So most companies see their product or service as one uh, experience, right? Which is kind of, it kind of makes sense. It's one product, right? One experience. But I think it's a mistake because in terms of motivation and engagement, um, how a person feels and, and what motivates them on day one is very, very different from day 100, right? The reason why you're there is different. Even the features you see are different. So I broke them down to four uh, experience phases. We have the discovery phase, which is why would even person, why do person even want to try to use your product, right? Why do, why do they care? What makes them want to do it? Is it just curiosity? I don't know. If it's, if it's a friend pushing them, that's discovery. And then there's onboarding, which is how you teach players the tools to play the game. And there's scaffolding, which is a regular journey, you know, your growth, and what makes people want to come back on a daily basis 
and usually do very repetitive actions over and over and over and over again. And then finally is the end game, which is how do you retain your veterans. And a lot of companies don't design for the end game, which is a big mistake, right? Because your, your veterans are usually your best evangelists, your best community organizers or moderators, their best monetization vehicles. And the only problem is that their veterans, they're, you know, they've been there forever. There's nothing new to do. So why do they, why would they stay there? And that's something a good game designer wants to design. And you can see a lot of games out there, right? You play them for three to eight months and you move on, right? But then there are games out there that have a tremendous amount of longevity. StarCraft, right? StarCraft, people played it, you know, when it started 15 years ago, when StarCraft 2 came out uh, a couple of years ago, everyone was still crazy about StarCraft 1, right? Diablo 2, how do you have games that people play for over 10 years? And that's something we study. Um, so on each one of these phases, there's an autolysis chart that's applied because everyone's motivation on each stage is different. So in a discovery, it could just be, hey, I'm, I'm unpredictably, Core Drive 7. Right? Oh, I'm curious. I, I read about this somewhere. Or it could be social uh, influence, right? My friend says, hey, you got to use this. This is awesome, right? That's a better, that's a stronger motivation. Sometimes it's epic meaning and calling. Hey, I'm trying out Kiva.org because I heard it's, it's great. I heard it's for the, it helps the world, right? Or I want to try to apply to Google because I heard they do no evil. Like they're, they, they're doing amazing things, like epic meaning and calling. Sometimes when it comes to enterprise solutions, loss and avoidance, oh, my boss told me to use the software, so I have to use it. I don't want to lose my job. Right, and that, that again, it's great at bottom lining this action happening, but it's not as inspiring. And for uh, scare, uh, for scarcity, right? That's how Facebook started. Facebook, that's why people discover Facebook, right? It's like at the beginning, it's just for Harvard student, and then it's for some Ivy League schools. And when it up, up went up to UCLA, where I went to, everyone's like, oh, we get to use this, and everyone got crazy about it. And uh, so as you as you build that scarcity, people want to join. They they, they want to join because they can't get in. And then there's some other spaces to innovate, right? Development accomplishment. How many of you know Keep, the company K-I-I-P? Okay, one, two. So, quick summary. Keep is a startup where it's a, pla a monetization platform where you're, maybe you're just playing a game and then you kill this dragon. And it says, ta-da-da, congratulations, you just killed this dragon. Here's a 10% coupon for Subway that you just earned. You know? So, again, they're basically saying people will value something more because they feel like they've earned it. Right? And usually they want to do something more relevant, like you're, you're using a running app and you finish 10, 10, 10, uh, 10 circles and it says, hey, you just unlocked a free water bottle at the convenience store next door. You know, that's, that's really relevant. So they're saying you want to discover something new because you feel accomplished. Right? So you can think through the eight core drives and see why would people want to discover it. I'm not going to go through all of them. But then you can think about, hey, onboarding. That's the space where you usually want to make people feel really smart. Core drive number two. Right? People, when they first try, they want to do a little bit of things like, hey, awesome, I, I, just, I just did a lot with, with, with not thinking that much. Right? People want to be hands-on, they want to feel smart. And then scaffolding, you know, anything goes. Right? End game, a, a lot of these core drugs apply too. What I've seen more often than that is really empowerment of creativity and feedback. Just because, you know, again, it's like Lego. Once you give people the basic blocks, there's so many ways to create different combinations. It's really engaging. And so those, that's the four, that's level two octalysis, applying the four experience phases. If you want to, you can push it another, up another level, which is applying different player types. Now, um, right now I just put the four, uh, Richard Bartle's four player types, just because it's pretty standard, but you don't have to go that way. Um, it could be anything like the talk we just heard about, right? It could be the, the possibility people, the probability people, the certainty people, right? Just how they think differently. And this really factors in how people are motivated differently, right? And you can't really please everyone, but at least you have a model to say, hey, maybe there's something for everyone at every stage, right? You can think that, hey, the achievers, you know, you can go to the next level and think about how they're motivated differently. So you can think, achievers would want to start the, want to try this out, the onboarding is great, they like it, but on scaffolding, you know, there's, there's no motivation there, so they leave. Explorers will try to, will try to start it, but onboarding, you know, it's not, it's kind of confusing, so they leave. Socializers won't even start. Killers are the ones that go through all the way to the end game and they stay. They're probably like killing all the noobs, feeling happy. So they're, they're playing the end game, whereas everyone is being frustrated by these killers, right? So, so once you think through all of that, again, sometimes the output isn't very complex, right? It doesn't have to be a crazy thing. Sometimes after thinking all of it, the end result is like a progress bar on LinkedIn, right? But I always believe that complexity should be, uh, or design should be complex in, uh, in thought, but simplistic in <coughs> output. And so again, um, when we think back, usually always you want to we always want to remember eight core drives. So one of the quick applications I want to show before before we end this 
is an um, is example of the speed cam lottery. Who, who knows about the speed cam lottery? All right, let me just show you how, this, how it works with a quick video and then analyze this through Octalis and see how we can actually possibly create a solution like this ourselves um, with the framework. So let's check this out. Then I'm the winner of Volkswagen's Fun Theory Award. My idea was the speed camera lottery. Could we get people to uh, pay the speed limit for fun? You guys all here? I really believe that fun can change human behavior for the better, and I was really thrilled to see that my idea, which started as a scribble submitted into this competition, uh, might even become reality. One, it would photograph uh, speeders, give them a uh, citation, uh, and that money goes to the pot. But if you're obeying the law, your picture will also get snapped. You'll be entered into a lottery and win some of that money from those speeders. So that's an example, right? We look at it's kind of interesting. It's like, hey, you beat, you you help people obey the speed uh, speed limit. And so again, some people look like, hey, that's really creative, right? And we want to kind of digest how can we come up with a solution like that with octalysis. So let's set out with a beginning problem of getting people to obey the speed limit, right? Without any human intervention, it's usually the one thing that's there is epic median calling. People feel like I should be a safe driver, right? That's it's responsible for me to be a safe driver. And so that, that kind of puts some limit to people's speeding, uh, driving behavior, but the problem here is that most people don't equate uh, being a fast driver to a dangerous driver, right? And this is where the government comes in, right? They started implementing loss and avoidance. They're saying, hey, if you speed, we're going to give you a ticket, right? And obviously, again, that bottom line is a lot of activity. Then people say, okay, then we don't want to speed as much because we don't want to get fined. Loss and avoidance. And then, you know, at one point, there's some innovation. They create, they put in something. Have you guys seen those things on the street where you drive? It tells you how fast you're driving but it doesn't really find you, it doesn't do anything, it just tells you that, right? So this is an example of empowerment of creative feedback. It allows you to see how fast you're going and tells you what is the wind state, did you hit the wind state or you, or you didn't hit the wind state, right? You have control, you're like, hey, I'm slowing down, speeding up, so I got a game, right? And I can see what I'm, how I'm doing. So that's empowerment of creativity and feedback. And there's still some issues there also because like, you always have to like, so what is the speed limit again? Like, what is, what is the wind state? That's unclear. So the speed camera lottery introduces a few more core drives into the process. So the first thing it does, is it adds ownership and possession, right? You can win money possibly. So whenever, so, so it's like, hey, I can acquire more money. So that's core drive number four, right? But also whenever you have a lottery system where people may or may not win money, that's core drive seven, unpredictability and curiosity, right? And that engages people. Again, you can see this guy like, like, oh, I doubt I'll win, but you know, this is kind of fun kind of thing, right? And then on top of that, it shows you development accomplishment because when you're driving by, it also shows you a thumbs up and thumbs down, right? It's like, oh, I won, oh, I didn't win, I won, I didn't win. So it makes you feel like you actually won when you actually obey the speed limit. Usually when you obey the speed limit, you don't see anything, you don't feel anything, there's no, there's no reward there, right? And then this is something a lot of people miss, social pressure, social influence, and relatedness, right? When you see, that's on a, it, when you see the example, it's on a busy street, and most people can see a result. You don't want to drive by and have the, everyone see like, oh, you're the loser that got a thumbs down. You want to be the guy that has a thumbs up, right? So that influences people. So when you think about, hey, how for this problem, getting people to uh, obey the speed limit, 
Um, how can we implement more of these eight core drive? You can potentially come up with a solution like that yourself and just be creative. I'm not saying all of them are the best solutions, but it allows you to, under to understand how can we motivate action um, better. So that concludes my talk. If you want to uh, learn a little bit more about it, you can go to talisman.com. You can always email me at ukai.ukaichihara.com, and I usually respond to all my emails. Uh, it's getting harder and harder, though. But thank you. If you have any questions, uh, let me know. Questions? No? Any questions for? No. If you don't, uh, you can me a partnering. We are doing enterprise gamification together. So we're doing consultancy. Uh, we just started with that, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's an important element here to help us as a tool to, to work with customers. Cool. Thank you. So okay. let's uh, thank you, Yukai. Let's, let's do a 10 minute break. Uh, and then we come to the last part.